Welcome to the Dough Roller Money Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Berger. Today, in episode 306, we're going to talk about a couple of tools that I've been using, financial tools that I think, uh, well, they've been extremely helpful to me, and I think they'll be useful to you. So I'm going to talk about uh, what they are and how I use them. One, one of them, uh, most of you are probably very familiar with, and I'm guessing one of them, maybe not so much. So that's what we're going to do today. Two financial tools that can help you with budgeting, it can help you with retirement planning, it, they can help you with uh, questions like, should you invest in a Roth or traditional retirement account? Should you do a Roth conversion? What's Social Security going to look like for you, you know, when you get to that point in your life? You know, those sorts of questions. That's what we're going to do today. Before we get to that, just kind of wanted to tell you a few things going on in my world, just for the heck of it. Been reading some great books. I've been really focused on, uh, it's probably as I get older, I think about these things, but, um, you know, do you get to a point in your, in, your, in your life when it's hard to learn new things? Is it hard to excel at new things? Uh, I've been putting those issues into practice and trying to improve my chess game, which most, most of the time feels like, you know, one step forward, 17 steps backward, <laughs> particularly when you're playing against like a 13-year-old and he or she is just phenomenal and you think, you know, I could probably spend 10 hours a day for the rest of my life and not be as good as, as, as this young, uh, uh, I guess, teenager, 13-year-old, let's say. Uh, you know, does the young mind just absorb this stuff better? And as you get older, you know, do, the, do, do, do you have fewer brain cells and they just don't seem to function quite as, as quickly, you know, as they used to? Um, so I've been reading a number of books. One of them is called Peak which kind of addresses this issue. Uh, it also dr- addresses the question, you know, the, 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 the tension between, you know, naturally born talent versus practice. Uh, and uh, the concept in the book Peak is um, called deliberate practice. It's a certain way to practice. Uh, the way I think about it is, you know, going to the driving range if you're a golfer. You know, you can go to the driving range and hit bucket of ball after, you know, buckets of balls, you know, all day long. You're probably not going to get a lot better, though, unless there's a purpose behind this. You're actually trying to improve a specific aspect of your game. And, uh, of course, there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, But that's sort of the idea behind deliberate practice. You're not just, you know, going through the motions. You have a specific goal of something you're trying to improve. Um, You have a a methodology for how to do it, which many times requires a coach or a trainer. Uh, and you're you're working outside of your comfort zone is another big part of it. So I've been I've been focused on that. Uh, I, I went to, I, I went to the chess club last Friday. I'm on a team. Uh, there's a team of six, and we play other teams. And it was a lot of fun. It came down to the last game. We ended up tying, but we were you know, the game started at 8 p.m. My game didn't finish until 12:45 in the morning. And I ended up winning that one, thank goodness. And then the last game didn't finish until like 1.30 in the morning. So we were all, you know, heading out of the chess club at like 2 in the morning by the time we were done. And uh, yeah, so that's that's my life. I know it's not very exciting, but uh, it is to me, I, actually. I'm at the gym where I train and people are talking about going bar hopping. They're like, they look at me, so what are you doing tonight? I'm like, well, I'm going to the chess club. Eh, the story of my life. Anyway, Peak is an excellent book. I'll talk about it more maybe in future podcasts, but I highly recommend it if that's the kind of thing that's of interest to you. I try to apply it to chess, but really you can apply it to anything. Writing, uh, even performance at your job, depending on what you do. Obviously anything uh, athletically. Uh, and great stories in the book about, you know, you, you see certain professional athletes, like a Tiger Woods. You know, well, you know, not everyone can be a Tiger Woods and Maybe he had you know naturally born talent, or Michael Jordan, or you know LeBron James, or I don't know Steph Curry, who's whoever the, the the athlete Peyton Manning. But when you dig down into it and you see the amount of practice that these folks go through and have gone through their entire careers, and of course before they were professional athletes, it's you know yeah they certainly you know particularly when it comes to something like basketball, um, there's certain physical traits you have to have if you're if you're five foot four. Your odds of, you know, becoming an, an NBA star, probably not great. Although, you know, I guess anything's possible. And there have certainly been very, very good, talented NBA players who are on the shorter side. But, you know, there are certain physical traits that certainly uh, play a big part in this. But when you, when, you, when you 
look under the covers and you see, you know, what they had to do to become as good as they are, you realize that it's a lot more than just natural talent. Uh, it's a lot of hard work. And uh, anyway, Peak, a great book, uh, highly recommend. I've been reading the biography of Alexander Hamilton, and I found it to be uh, uh, very refreshing given our current political climate. And I, I define that really as the last couple of decades, not the last two years. But I think there's this general view that you know nothing gets done, that the acrimony in Washington is worse than it's ever been. Um, and while there may be some truth to that, when you read history, you realize, eh, eh, it's really kind of been this way from the very beginning, right? I mean, you know, Adams and, and, and Jefferson, you know, didn't get along for a good, <laughs> and that's an understatement, for a good period of, uh, of, of their time together. At, at times they did, but in fact, at times uh, Jefferson was very close to John Adams and his family. But at other times, it was gloves off, uh, just fisticuffs, no, you know, toe to toe. And of course, Alexander Hamilton uh, didn't get along with a lot of people. And eventually, a sitting vice president killed him. I mean, so, you know, uh, when you look at the issues that they had as they were forming our government uh, and the disagreements, and, and there were, you know, they were numerous, and they were just as bitter and uh, nasty as they are today. Uh, it kind of puts what we're going through, I don't know, in the right context. So anyway, that's been an excellent book. I already read an, a biography on Washington and then Adams and then Jefferson. Uh, I thought I'd take a break from presidents and read uh, Alexander Hamilton's biography. And uh, so that's, that's kind of what I've been doing. All right, enough about that. Let's talk about money. So I want to put the two tools we're going to talk about today. Uh, one is YNAB which uh, that's the one most of you, I'm sure, is, have heard of. The other one that many of you may not have heard of is called e-money. We're going to talk about that. Uh, but I want to put this into some context. So as longtime listeners know, I sold Do Roller, and for that matter, this podcast, earlier, earlier, earlier this year to a great company, great group of people who I think are continuing to do great things with it, and they've been kind enough to allow me to stay behind the mic here, for the podcast. But the reason I bring that up is that when I sold Dole Roller, my thought at the time was, okay, that's it. I'm retired, financially speaking. And by that, what I mean is I'll start living off of our, my wife and I will start living off of our investments, if not completely, to still a large degree. And what I learned, by the way, that ended up not happening, at least not yet. I think that will happen sooner rather than later. But during that time when I thought it was going to happen right away, uh, I realized that the process of going from, you know, working and earning an income that you live on to relying on your investments psychologically <clears throat> is a huge transition. And intellectually, I, I, I knew that to be the case. But now having lived through it, <laughs> it takes on a whole different feel. And your whole risk tolerance changes. You know, when, you, when you're not bringing in money from a job and you're relying on your, you know, maybe some Social Security, although my wife and I aren't to that age yet, and your, you know, your Vanguard funds or your Fidelity funds or wherever you keep your investments, uh, you know, a drop in the market of 5 or 10%, and we had, what, a drop of about 7% in October, it takes on a whole different feel. It's... Um, it, uh, it's scary in a way that it's just not when you're, whatever, 45 and, yeah, you've got your money invested and you certainly don't like to see the market go down. But one, you're many years away from needing it. And two, uh, you're not using it at all now, right? You've got money coming in and you're continuing to invest each month in a 401k or an IRA. When you start to rely on that money to live on, it changes the whole dynamic. And it changed it for me. Now, it didn't, by the way... I didn't sell anything in October. I didn't change my asset allocation. I didn't make any decisions based on these feelings. It was more like, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it was more like I was sort of marveling at them. It's like, wow, I didn't see that coming. Look at these strong feelings I have about the market falling 7%. Um, it was more of an intellectual thing for me to, to sit there and evaluate my feelings and emotions about uh, the market, given my, I guess we'll call it a transition, maybe a little slower than I expected, but still a transition into uh, uh, retirement. 
And it caused me to do two things, which will bring me to YNAB and eMoney. Uh, the first was to really understand exactly how much money we need to live on. And I say it that way on purpose. In other words, I'm not saying to figure out how much money we spend each month or each year. Because how much money you spend in a given month or even a given year is different than how much money you need to live on. Why is that? It's because you'll need money uh, at various times that you, don't that you don't spend year in and year out. I'll give you an example. In our budget, we set aside $1,000 a month for future repairs to our home. Now, that's a lot of money. Why do we do that? Because I know we're going to need a new roof, and that's expensive. And I know in the not-too-distant future, we're going to need a new furnace and air conditioner, and those are expensive. Now, it might be five years. I, I hope it's at least five years. It might be five years before we need them, uh, that money, but we're going to need it eventually. Uh, and it doesn't show up in what we spend this month or this year. It's, it's even uh, somewhat harder to plan than the periodic expense expenses that, that are probably more commonly talked about, like saving up for your annual vacation or saving up for, for Christmas and holiday spending or saving up for your, your six-month insurance premium. That's an important step, too, in budgeting. But we have these items that are much longer in, ter uh, in term. You know, you might go, hopefully you go 20 or 30 years before you need a new roof, but the day's going to come when you need a new roof. Um, the same, by the way, can be true with a new car. Uh, you may have no car payment, terrific, and you may not have no plans to get a new car, great. But the day's going to come, presumably, when you're going to need to replace your car. Are you saving for it now? So that was sort of the question on my mind. I had a rough idea of what my wife and I needed uh, in retirement, but I didn't, I couldn't say I had it with 100% certainty, and I wanted that certainty. Pardon me why I take a sip of my coffee. So that was the first thing. The second thing related to it was, once I have some understanding of what I think we need to live on uh, for the rest of our lives uh, on an annual basis... How do I figure out with some degree of certainty whether we have enough money to fund that, that I guess, uh, lifestyle, if you will? How do I know? There's, and, and that question gets immensely complicated, right? You have to make an assumption about when you're going to die. You have to make an assumption about inflation. Uh, you have to make an assumption about your investment returns. Uh, those are probably three of the biggest assumptions you make. Um, you, of course, you do have to make an assumption about what you'll need. Uh, um, you know, we can certainly calculate what we spend right now. We can adjust for those longer-term purchases that I mentioned, uh, and maybe that's a reasonable assumption, but it's still an assumption. We have no idea what kind of health issues we'll encounter or any other potential expenses down the road, so you have to make an assumption about that. And then you have these sort of ancillary issues to consider. For example... Should you do any Roth conversions, uh, converting traditional retirement money into a Roth retirement account um, or not? Uh, if you're can still contributing to a 401k or IRA, should you contribute to a tr traditional one or a Roth? Uh, how should you think about Social Security uh, in terms of, one, will it even be there uh, when, you, when you hit uh, you know, 62 to 70? Uh, and what will those benefits look like? And should you rely on them at all even? Maybe you should take them completely out of the equation for purposes of planning. And if they happen to still be there when, uh, when you retire, then that's just gravy, right? But these are assumptions uh, that, you have to, you know, that you have to consider. And uh, another one might be, uh, will you annuitize any of your investments? Will you take some of your investments and buy an annuity? I'm not a particular fan of annuities, but I do understand that they can... They can certainly serve a, play a role in some retirements. Um, so the, you have all of these questions, and it turns out that how you go about answering them, the assumptions that you make, have a huge impact on the results. So given those sort of challenges, one, what are, what are my wife and I going to need to live on? And two, once we have some rough idea of that, do we have enough money along with all the other issues that I've uh, spelled out. How do I get answers to that? And what tools do I use? And so what I decided to do was to rely on YNAB for our budget 
and e-money. Now, e-money, um, let me actually start with e-money. So e-money is a tool that financial planners use. You can't, as an individual, go out and just you know get access to e-money and start using it yourself. It doesn't work that way. So how did I get access to it? Uh, well, I use Mark Zorrell. You know, he's the, the $96 a year financial planner. I've talked, I had him on the show. We've talked about him in the past. And he has started to use e-money. That is the tool that he uses uh, with his clients. And I want to sort of walk through my experience using the tool along with my experience in working with Mark uh, uh, and this tool together, right? So the way Mark works now, uh, and by the way, I should add quickly, just so we're clear, I have no financial uh, relationship with Mark, with eMoney or YNAP, none. I don't get any money from any of these sources. Uh, there's no, they don't advertise for me. Um, so uh, there's no financial relationship. All right. So what Mark does when you now sign up for his service, he gives you access to eMoney. Uh, he has it as a financial planner. Uh, and um, you connect all of your accounts. If you've used personal capital, it's, um, it's very similar to that. So you connect your investment accounts, your bank accounts, your credit cards, whatever accounts you want to connect, 401ks, IRAs, taxable accounts. And it uh, you know, sucks all that data in, into e-money, just like uh, personal capital does. And you have to spend some time with it. Uh, one of the things you have to do is you have to tell e-money whether an account is a retirement account or not, and whether it's a Roth or a traditional. Those were the two big things that I had to, it was very easy to do, but I had to go in and make sure that eMoney understood the types of accounts that had been uh, brought into the system. Now, one of the things that Mark does is he's created a number of videos that walk you through how to do each of these things. I found it to be fairly intuitive and easy to do. I was able to, to do all of that without any direct interaction with Mark at all. So at this point, I have not spoken to Mark about it. I have not emailed him, uh, right? I, 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 I'd, I'd been a client since I'd interviewed him, boy, was that a year or two ago, I guess? Uh, but he gave me access to the system and that was it. And I watched the videos and I did all of this uh, without any direct assistance from Mark or from the folks at eMoney, and, and it worked uh, pretty easily. So once you get all that data in there, Mark is going to go through and uh, make sure it's correct, and he does his own sort of formatting and some assumptions that he enters. So the, the, the planner can go in and make assumptions that you, the end user, if you will, and that I can't make. So for example... I can't go in and set what assumption I want for inflation, right? Mark has to do that. But that's fine. I mean, he'll set it for whatever you want. Uh, but there's you know, certain settings that only he can make. And that's just the way. It's not his choice. That's just the way e-money is set up. So he went through and made some his sort of standard uh, assumptions. He has an assumption about what your returns will be on your investments before you retire. Uh, I think his standard assumption is 5%, which is extremely conservative. And then, I, and then he has an assumption about what your returns will be after you retire. I forget what that is. He has an assumption about inflation uh, and so on. And he goes in and, and sets all that up. Uh, and then you guys you schedule a phone call. And that's exactly what we did. And uh, my primary question, as I mentioned, was, <laughs> or do we have enough to retire on? And uh, so let me kind of walk through how eMoney answers that question. Um, to begin with, it has a dashboard. It's not unlike personal capitals. I would say personal capitals dashboard and interface is is slicker. I guess that's the right way to say it. Fancier, cooler um, than eMoney. But but in terms of the data, you know, the data is the data. It's all there. And so eMoney has a dashboard. The way I've got mine set up, there's there's some ability to change this. It has my net worth including how it's changed over the last month. It has my investments, including a quick snapshot of, uh, at a very high level, uh, asset allocation. I'm basically 70% stocks and 30% bonds and cash. And that is reflected right there on, in the dashboard. It shows me some recent transactions, um, it should, including by transactions, I mean income coming in, expenses going out. Uh, it shows me my cash balance across all my accounts, how much I owe on all my credit cards, um, how much I have total in terms of investments. You can put in your house and you can put in other assets. So it's a nice da dashboard when you log in. 
Um, where you find uh, cash flow is in a report that is helpfully called cash flow. So you click on reports, which I'm doing now to look at my own, and I select the cash flow report. And this maps out your cash flow from today until you die. Now, of course, you have to make an assumption about when you're going to die. And I asked Mark to assume that my wife and I would live to be 100 years old. And my thinking on that was, um, it's un- I guess statistically speaking, it's unlikely we'll live to be 100. But I wanted to make sure that if we did, we would have enough money, right? So that's why I set it at 100. But obviously, you can set it whatever you want. Uh, Mark can also run what if scenarios. I, so I suppose, he, you know, what if you live to be 120? I don't know. Um, whatever what if scenarios you want to run, Mark can run them for you. I think we originally had this set at, at a death date of like 90 or 92. Uh, and then we just increased it to 100. I then asked him to set inflation at 2.5%. I think he had it lower than that. And I wanted to be a little more conservative. Truthfully, 2.5, I mean, one could argue for a higher inflation rate. I think we've been spoiled um, with our current inflation rate. I mean, I'm old enough to remember double-digit inflation here in the United States. Uh, you know, we've had such low inflation, relatively speaking, for so long that the thought of a 10% inflation rate seems impossible. But we know that it's not impossible. But in any event, um, I set the inflation at 2.5%. That's important primarily... Because once you start taking money out uh, each month, each year, from your investments to meet your spending needs, those spending needs will get adjusted by that inflation rate, okay? So we set ours at 2.5%. I set my returns at 7%, and I said Mark, I think, had hit, had him originally at 5 um, So I was able to look at the numbers if we assume a 5% rate of return, um, I set them at 7 Historically, a 70-30 portfolio has returned uh, over the last 100 years uh, over 9%. But I, you know, I want to be conservative. I think 7% is, I'm not sure if I'd call it conservative exactly, but I, I do think it's reasonable. But again, you can have them set it at whatever you want, uh, and you can run different scenarios. You can set it at 7 but hey, Mark, what happens if I only earn 5%? What's that do to my to my nest egg. So you, you can run those scenarios um, if you'd like to. So we set it at 7%. Uh, it, this covers, it shows you your uh, social security benefits and it can run the report for you based on all of uh, a, a number of data points. Uh, it also shows your required minimum distribution starting at 70 and a half. So I look at those, and I'm looking at my cash flow report now. I see those, they're called planned distri- distributions. They show up uh, for, for my wife uh, and then I'm a couple of years younger. You know, they, they start for me uh, a couple of years later. So they're f- factored in there. The other thing you can do, which I found very useful, is you can include one-off expenses. So, for example, if you plan to uh, take a trip around the world when you're 70 and it's going to cost you whatever, $10,000, um, you, can, you can actually put that in there. We're going to have a $10,000 expense. Uh, in this year, you can you know specify the year. You can break out your budget. I mean, you can break it out in fine detail. Now we didn't do that. We just set up a, a yearly spending assumption uh, and said, okay, it's going to begin in, in in two years, 2020, and this is how much we're going to take out in 2020, and then after that, adjust it for inflation. But you can drill down and get. You could say, well, I want to separate out healthcare. This to give you an idea of how robust this tool is. You could say, well, I think we're going to have a lot of health care expenses, so I might have an overall budget for everything else, but I want a separate budget for health care expenses, medical expenses, and I want a special inflation rate just for medical. I think everything else will be 2.5%, but I'm concerned health care costs are going to go up faster than that, so I want to assume a 4% inflation rate for health care or whatever the number is. So you can really fine-tune this and get very, very uh, granular if you want to. Uh, that's not what what we did. We tended to take a bit of a more of a high level approach. And so once you get this information in there with Mark's help, 
it runs a cash flow report. It shows you for each year, here's your income coming in, whether that's from your, your current job if you're still working or a part-time job if you have one in retirement, uh, as well as Social Security. It shows you your investment income, which is, is, is income. They define that as income coming from taxable investments. And then it shows you your planned distributions from your, you know, your required minimum distributions. Uh, and, and sort of adds up all of those inflows. And then it shows you your expenses, which is something that, again, you set. Again, we just had one number. You could um, uh, you could have it as a different number if, if you want. Um, uh, but we just had it as one number. You could, again, go as, as, into as much detail as you'd like to. Um, and then it nets out the cash flow for each year. So you have so much coming in. You have so much going out. Here's what you, you, you have left, whether it's a negative number or a positive number. And, um, and then your total portfolio assets, which, of course, also get adjusted each year based on your assumption of, of returns. Again, we use 7%. And, you know, I'm not going to get into the specific numbers for my wife and I. They don't really matter uh, for you. Um, all right? We're all in different situations. But I will say this. I was pleasantly surprised. Um, I was pleasantly surprised that, given what I think are fairly conservative assumptions, uh, we're not going to run out of money, <laughs> right? That's, that's the good news. Uh, uh, and we've, we ran different scenarios with Mark. You know, we, for the, from a reporting perspective, I had him set the returns at 7%. And what that means is when I log in and look at this cash flow report, it's assuming 7%, right? But we looked at 5% return assumptions. We even looked, at, I think, at a 3% return assumption. Um, and so I got very comfortable that you know we should be fine. Now, one one feature, uh, one one nice thing that you can set. You don't have to rely on Mark for this. Is is your expenditures right? So you can you know let's say you go in there and you put in I don't know let's make up I'll make a round nice round number hundred thousand a year you're going to spend in retirement, and then you think well, okay well what if it's one twenty five? Well you can go in and change that yourself. Or what if it's you know what if what, what if we make it seventy five? You can you can change those numbers. And then rerun the cash flow report and see, you know, oh no, we're going to be we're going to be out of money if we spend uh, this much, but we'll be okay if we spend that much, or, or whatever the case may be. Um, now, I also had Mark run different scenarios on Roth conversions. I had this assumption that I would be converting a lot of traditional IRA uh, monies to Roth IRA monies over the next, uh, I guess, fifteen years. What I've found out is that. In our case, it really won't make a huge difference one way or another. Now, I think for a lot of people it will. There are various reasons why it won't for us. Part of it is we have more in taxable accounts than we do retirement accounts, which I think for a lot of people is probably unusual. Um, but now, of course, keep in mind that when you do the analysis on whether you should do a Roth conversion, or for that matter, whether you should invest in a Roth or traditional IRA from the beginning, you have to make assumptions about taxes, right? And that, I mean, goodness, that's anyone's guess. I've stopped trying to guess. I mean, it, my assumption would be to assume it's just what it is today. Uh, and some would say, oh, that's crazy, Rob. Of course, taxes are going to go up, uh, particularly after the last tax cut. Well, it, you may be right. And you can, you know, with Mark, you can make whatever assumptions you want. Uh, what I will probably end up doing is converting some traditional IRA to Roth, but not as much as I had originally planned. Um, and and uh, more importantly, I realize that it's probably not going to make a huge difference. And that was good information to have. Um, and I only I couldn't get that on my own. There's two the calculations are too complex. Uh, you really need a tool like eMoney. And by the way, a lot of financial planners. I mean, if you already have a financial planner, I, certainly they're going to be already using eMoney or a similar tool that should be able to do all this for you. Uh, my experience is with Mark, which is why I'm sharing that with you. Uh, but uh, the calculations, I mean, trying to do this on your own, I mean, there are online tools and you could try that. I mean, you know, maybe that'll work, but it, it, it helped not only to have the tool, but then to have a phone call with Mark so we could walk through it and I could ask him, as you, as you might imagine, I peppered him with a thousand questions. And so uh, the upshot was, for me, Roth conversions probably won't be as important as I thought they would be. And frankly, I'm happy with that because it's like, it's like, oh, good. That's one less thing I have to, to worry about. I mean, I might still convert some, fine, but it's not like I got to sit there and, and worry about exactly how much to convert and do I have enough money in the bank to pay the taxes and you know all that sort of thing. Uh, so uh, 
that's it for e-money. I mean, it, there, the tool does a lot more than what I've just described. Um, what I walked through was what was important to me and what I think is probably important to a lot of you. Um, but there may be other things that are important to you. And um, he can walk through all of this with you. So, um, and, and that's one of the things he'll ask you. You know, it, what are the questions you have? What are the issues you're concerned about? You know, what things do you need to to walk through. And so for you right now, it may not be cash flow and retirement, uh, it may be something else. Um, there's this whole spending section of e-money and you can actually lay out a full budget within e-money. As you know, I didn't do that. Uh, I can go to this section, I look, I'm looking at it now, and it sucks in all the expenses from my credit cards and our bank, and it, it, it categorizes them based on data that actually comes from, I'm going to guess, Yodley, but um, it it, it no doubt comes from the service e-money uses to bring the data in in the first instance. And it's the same thing, by the way, that personal capital does and a lot of budgeting apps do. It's no different, really. Um, it's hit or miss. Uh, some things are right. Some things are, are not right. Um, but I decided uh, not to rely on that for the budgeting. What I wanted to use was YNAB. Uh, so let's turn to that. And I'm loading my YNAB. So I've used YNAB off and on. I used it before it was a subscription service. As I think most of you know, it's now online, a subscription service. I think it's like five bucks a month. I pay yearly. I don't remember what I paid. Um, it's roughly $5 a month. And having used it now for a couple of months, uh, pretty religiously, I absolutely, I think it's bar none, the best budgeting app available. And I've used Quicken, I've used uh, Mint, I've used iBank, I've used a spreadsheet, um, I've used personal capital. And all those tools are good, and they all have, um, I think, pros and cons, but for me, the best pure budgeting app is YNAB. And I kind of want to walk through how I'm using it. I know some of you already use it, um, but I think it's, 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 if you're not using it and you're looking for a budgeting app, I would highly recommend it. One thing to keep in mind, YNAB takes some getting used to. And uh, I think there are a couple of reasons for this. Back in the day, when I would want to figure out what we were spending, I would do what I'm guessing maybe many of you have done. I would get a spreadsheet or piece of paper, and I would, I would list out all our categories that I could think of. And then I would, um, either through looking up historical rec records or just making a guess, write down what, what I think we spend per month in each category. So you'd have your utilities and your internet and you know, your phone bill, your rent, your mortgage. Uh, and then you get, you get these other categories like clothing. It's like, what do I put for that? I don't know. Uh, a couple hundred bucks, whatever. You know, you don't spend that every month or we don't, but then, then you go out and you, you know, for the kids getting ready for school or whatever, you spend more money, but you'd put something down, something down for gifts, something down for vacation, insurance. And you total all up at the end and, you, you know, you kind of hope and pray that you like the number at the bottom and that it's at least less than your income, right? And um, then you might start tracking. That's sort of how I think through budgeting. That is not how YNAB works, at least not initially. With YNAB, you connect your bank, and credit, your bank accounts and your credit cards, and it sucks in a bunch of data. Now, if you think about that, depending on when you do it, of course, you're going to have whatever you have in the bank, checking and savings, whatever that number is, it's going to show up in YNAB. And if you use credit cards, even if you pay them off in full each month, odds are there is some kind of balance on your credit card. So that's going to show up. Now, um, how you deal with both of those uh, took me a little while to figure out. Let's start with the bank accounts. So let's say you connect your accounts and you've got uh, $1,000 in savings and $500 in checking, and it's the 12th of the month right? This idea of sort of listing all the categories and how much you spend on a, on a monthly basis is not how YNAB works. What YNAB says is you've got $1,000 in savings, you've got $500 in checking. How are you going to spend that money, right? How, where's that money going? Give, it, give, give each dollar a job, right? And so you say, well, today's a 12th, um, I don't know, you, you start to think about your bills for the rest of the month. Well, I, I guess, oh, let's see, I got to pay the gas bill, you know, and what's that? Okay, you, you budget for it. And, um, you know, you've got uh, uh, rent, I don't know, say you pay the rent on the 15th. Uh, it's probably unusual, but we'll just make it up as we go. You got to budget for that. You're only budgeting based on the money you have in your checking and savings account. And so for me, 
I think I started this, in, I did start this in the middle of a month. That was a little hard for me to wrap my mind around. I, I kept wanting to, to see my whole monthly picture. So I wanted to budget for everything. But that's not how YNAB works. Now, what happens is once you get to uh, the next full month, you do start budgeting for the whole month, but you're only budgeting based on what's in your checking and savings account. So if you get paid twice a month and you got paid, let's say, on the the 30th of uh, November, uh, you'll budget that money for the first half of December, but you won't budget for the rest of December until you get your second paycheck, assuming you're kind of living paycheck to paycheck, if you will eventually the goal is that take december as an example that come december 1 you already have all of the money you're going to spend in december in the bank you're budgeting 30 days ahead one month ahead that's ultimately the goal and once you reach that goal then you really are budgeting for a full month at a time right and that's that's where we are and they actually have a neat feature called age of money uh, and the idea is how old is your money when, between when it gets budgeted and when you actually spend it, right? So uh, it takes probably two weeks for that to show up in YNAB. And then it's, in our case, it slowly got longer and longer. So right now our age of money is 29 days. I think it's going to end up settling around 60 days is my guess because we tend to have a couple of months of money um, uh, in the checking and savings account ahead of time. Uh, but it's going to take some time for that to happen and it's going to take some time to sort of wrap your mind around the way YNAB works. One of the things I found very helpful was the videos that they have and the webinars that they hold. And I, I, I watched several of them, and I would highly recommend them. They're very good. But here's what happens. Eventually, once you get through that hurdle, you have um, your categories, and you can organize them however you want. Um, and they give you, they start you out with sort of the standard set of, 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 of spending categories. I've created uh, my own, some of YNABs, I've deleted, I've added some, and you can organize them however you want. Um, The way I organize ours, you you can think of them as in folders. So I have a home folder, and that has everything from home insurance to maintenance to real estate taxes, um, and I include utilities in this category. So electric, uh, trash, water, gas, I include the internet, and I include what I call home CapEx, capital expenditures. That's the savings we're putting aside for a roof someday and a furnace and an air conditioner and all those sorts of things. The reason I do it that way is then within that home category, the budget gets totaled and I can look at the number and I can weep. (laughs) It's unbelievable to me how much it costs. And we don't have a mortgage anyway. Um, Then I do the same thing with transportation. And I call it transportation because it would include like if you use Uber, right, Um, or Lyft, um, or if you rent a car from time to time. But I include, we have a car lease for my business that will be ending in a few months, thank goodness. And then I'll, if I, if I replace it, I'll just pay cash. Um, but a car lease, you know, car maintenance, licensing and licenses and fees, uh, gas, auto insurance. We have car tax here in Virginia. And then we, this is interesting for us. We have a boat. Now, I like to, I'd love to tell you it's a yacht or something. It's not. It's a pontoon boat. Uh, not, uh, I mean, you know, I'm not a boat person, so, uh, <laughs> I got this for my wife. She wanted a boat. We got a pontoon boat and I have a, uh, you know, we don't owe anything on it. Um, but it costs money, you know? And so I have a, even, I guess that's transportation. We, it takes us from point A to point B. Um, uh, you know, it's funny. I grew up on the water. I mean, my, my stepfather was a, a bass fisherman. You know, the, the, I think I, I don't know if I've talked about this or not. The bass boat with 150 horsepower Johnson on the back end and, you know, hammered down and you're just flying across the lake at like five in the morning, freezing to death, wishing to God you were anywhere else but on that boat. You can see why I don't like boats. Anyway, uh, we have a boat. So we have that. It's all in transportation. So I can look at that category, that group of spending categories, and like the home uh, number, I can look at the transportation number and weep. Um, It's ridiculous. But those two categories represent almost 50% of our expenses. I got to work on that. Um, And then I also have one called subscriptions. You know, everything is a subscription these days, right? Um, We have Simply Safe, which is an alarm system subscription. Apple Music and Storage, subscription. Hulu Plus, subscription. YouTube TV, subscription. I'm embarrassed to even mention these. Netflix, subscription. Amazon Prime. That's a yearly thing, but it's a subscription. 
I have Bloomberg and, and Wall Street Journal. I actually got rid of Bloomberg and I'm getting rid of the Wall Street Journal, I think. Um, but I have subscriptions because I think over time, the reason I categorized it that way was but over time, you know, these are small expenses, but over time, you know, you subscribe to this and that and pretty soon it's no longer a small expense. And so by categorizing them in the same sort of folder in YNAB, I can see uh, what we budget each month for subscriptions. And I'm not going to tell you that number because I'm embarrassed. Okay. Um, and it goes on down. I have everyday expenses, things like the grocery store and all that sort of thing. Um, and we have longer term expenses, right? Like clothing. We, we, we set aside money for clothing, for gifts. Um, we're going on a, a, a big vacation next year for our 30th anniversary, which we celebrated earlier this year. So we're going with friends to Greece. So um, um, we're, we're, not, we're not really world travelers. It's not the kind of thing that I would need to budget for every year, we, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, 30 years, I figure she put up with me for 30 years. She deserves a nice trip. And she said I could come with her. So that's a bonus. All right. So uh, how you organize this is up to you. I would highly recommend that you watch the videos because you'll get a lot of interesting ideas. And let me give you one. Uh, this came from one of the YNAB videos. It's not how I do it, but I think for some of you, it could be a, an interesting way to organize some of these expenses. And what they suggested was this. Uh, for your monthly bills, right? So your utilities, your phone, your internet, cell phone, uh, rent, mortgage, whatever you have, all of your monthly bills. Um, when you list the category name, which you can define what it is, let's say electric bill. Also include in the name of the category the, the day of the month it's due. So let's say your electric bill is due on the 12th. So you'll have electric, electric or electric bill and then 12th as, as the name of the category. Same thing for your phone bill and everything else. Then put them in the order in which they're due because you can drag and drop these categories uh, uh, into whatever order you want. And so you'll have the things due earlier in the month at the top all the way down to something that you have maybe due at the end of the month every month at the bottom. And that way, when your paycheck comes in and you're trying to figure out you know, how you're going to spend that money, how you're going to budget it, you don't have to start thinking, okay, which bill comes due next? You've got it right there in order with the dates in the name of each spending category. I thought that was pretty creative. And then you can just start at the top. Okay, I got I to gotta put money towards the electric bill. That's the first one that's due Next, so whatever, 100 bucks to electric bill or whatever it is. Um, we don't do it that way, but I thought that was a pretty creative idea, so I thought I'd mention it. And so having done this uh, for the last couple of months, um, I've learned a couple of things. One is, particularly when you factor in money for future expenses, like I mentioned a new roof, uh, you may not have a car payment and you may not have a plan for, to get a car for five years, but you probably should be saving for it now. When you factor in those future expenses, you realize, yeah, life's expensive. And you maybe you're spending or will, will eventually be spending more than you thought. And that's certainly true with us. This was very eye-opening for me um, and not in a good way. I mean, I guess it's a good way in the sense that I'm now more prepared. Uh, now, part of it will get a little better for us. I'm, I'm still budgeting for our, our, uh, one of our, our children's uh, college education. And um, I have faith they'll eventually graduate. And once they do, I have faith that I'll stop paying tuition and books and fees. So over time, I think our expenses will, will come down. Uh, also, when you start budgeting like, like we did, um, obviously in the middle of a year, you have certain annual expenses that come due. Like we pay our life, my life insurance once a year, for example. It comes due in January. Well, I had to budget a lot more uh, in order to have the right number by January. So, so I had to budget, you know, say a third of that bill over the last three months, for example. Well, come January, when I'm budgeting for the following year, it'll be one twelfth that amount, right? So um, my monthly budget, there, was, there were a couple of expenses like that for us. And so once I've worked through this and gotten through three or four or five months with it, um, the monthly budget number will come down. And that'll certainly be true once I get through an entire, an entire year. So there is hope or light at the end of the tunnel uh, for, for, for the Berger family. But I'll tell you, when you look at this and you look at the expenses and you go down them uh, one by one and you realize just how much you're spending, uh, you can really start to say, okay, how can I make some changes to this? 
What changes do we need to make? Have some good conversations with your significant other. My wife and I have not yet done that, but we will. And I'm, I'm sure she's looking forward to it. Not necessarily the most fun, but very important. And I have found YNAB to be extremely easy to use, extremely easy to understand. If I had any criticism at all, it would be the reporting's not very good. Um, I don't like the reports. Um, the best one, and I'm pulling it up now, is income versus expenses. Uh, that's the report I probably use the most. And it's pretty good. Um, by the way, how you organize your spending categories gets reflected on the report. So give that some thought when you're, when you're doing the, your organizational work. Uh, th that can be very helpful or it can prove to not work at all and you might have to change some things. But again, changing the organization is as easy as dragging and dropping categories. So it's very simple. But that does get reflected in the report. So I found that um, the, the reporting could be better, but the income versus expense report, which is my primary concern, uh, is just fine. I will say that I also run my business expenses through YNAB. Now, you know, my business expenses and income now are quite low. Um, so it's not entirely significant, but it can throw things off. Um, and what I mean by that is I'll look at how much we've budgeted for the month and I'll think, well, wow, that's not right. Why is it so much? And then I realize, oh, no, that's because I've included uh, some business expenses uh, that come up periodically. And, it's, and, and I could get rid of them if I shut the business down, but there are reasons why I don't. Um, but I do run our business expenses through YNAB al along with our personal expenses. Uh, I just create a separate category for them that I creatively call business expenses. Um, and so it works, but you know you have to make some adjustments mentally when you're looking at reporting because they'll show up obviously in the reports. You don't have to do that. If you have your own business, you could keep it separate. It's just that I want to treat all of our expenses the same way from a planning and budgeting perspective. Um, so that's, that's what I do. Anyway, I have found YNAB to be, uh, I, I've, pro I've used it more in the last few months than ever before. I've used it before, particularly before it was a subscription model, but I, I don't know, maybe it's just, uh, I had more of a need for it, uh, today than I have in the past, but, uh, I found it to be very, very useful and that's how I use it. I will say initially I had some trouble connecting some accounts and uh, let me tell you this, I think it happened with one of my banks, uh, and I don't know why this is. I, I, I had issue after issue after issue. I, I re reached out to YNAB support. They were very responsive. But we couldn't figure out the issue. And then I read one of their articles, YNAB's articles, and I f it turns out, and I don't know why this is, but that for some banks, if you use certain characters in your bank's password, right, it will not import into YNAB. And I don't think it's YNAB. I think it's the service that imports it, which is probably Yodely as well. Um, so once I, I figured that out, and it took me like a month to find that article. And I went in and changed my password at my bank. Still a very complicated password. I just avoided a couple of different characters, and I don't remember what they were. But I avoided the characters that don't work, and it imported fine. Um, beyond that, the only other issue I've had is with Capital One credit cards. You have to reauthenticate the account well, whenever you want to download transactions. Now, that uh, that doesn't take very long. It's basically entering a code that Capital One texts you. Uh, but it's an extra step. But again, not a big deal. But I thought I'd share the good and the bad. And so those have been a couple of issues I've had with uh, importing data. But otherwise, it works fantastic. And it's helped me begin to understand uh, what we need to live on. I say begin to understand because... I really think I'm going to need a full year's worth of data to have the level of confidence I want in understanding what we need. Um, but I've already learned a ton from the data. Some things have been uh, a pleasant surprise, and other things have <laughs> uh, not been so pleasant. I guess that's life, right? So that's it. YNAB and eMoney, I think they, they're great tools. Again, eMoney you have to use with an advisor, a financial planner. I use Mark Zorrell. I know many of you do too. You may use someone else. That's great. Uh, they're going to use eMoney or a similar tool. I found it to be extremely valuable. So that's the deal. If you have any questions about them, uh, join the Facebook group. Go to doughroller.net slash Facebook group. Uh, I am on there every day. I'm not always commenting, usually because I don't need to, because the, the members, there's over 6,000 members now. 
they beat me to it and they have great responses to questions and comments. So, but I do, I do jump in the fray and comment here and there, but uh, if you have questions or you, you want to share your own experience with YNAB or eMoney or any other tool, would love to hear from you. Just go to doorroller.net slash forward slash Facebook group. Join the conversation. We'd love to have you. I'd love to hear from you. So that's it. Well, listen, I hope you have a great week. By the way, uh, before I let you go, Ohio State beat Maryland. I don't know f- football fans out there. That was an unbelievable game. 52 to 51. I got to give credit to Maryland. You know, it was a gutsy call at the end going for the two-point conversion. Uh, they played a heck of a football game. Frankly, they deserved to win. But as a Buckeye fan, I'm kind of glad they didn't. Uh, that would have left a mark. Uh, anyway, that's it for me. That's all I got. Uh, I think next time we're going to talk about what are what uh, mental models. It's something that um, Charlie Munger from uh, Berkshire Hathaway talks a lot about. And we're going to talk about mental models as they relate to personal finance and investing. So I think that's what we're going to do next time. Until then, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom.